The case you're about to see and the characters portrayed are fictional, but the procedure is legally accurate. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the general public. I have given careful considerations, Charles, to your submissions, and equally, Mr. Willard, to your objections, particularly concerning the relevance of some of the evidence that Sir Charles wishes the jury to hear. The accused are charged with committing the offence of publishing a blasphemous libel, the offence of blasphemy. Ignoring the case of Regina versus Gay News, and I would advise you both that at arriving at my conclusions, I have ignored that case as it is the subject of an appeal hearing, I reject the defence submission to call expert witnesses to demonstrate that the words complained of are true. It is no defence with regard to the crime of blasphemy to prove that the words complained of are true or that their publication was for the public benefit. I reject this submission. As the law stands at present, Expert witnesses may not be called when the charge is one of blasphemy. I am, however, prepared to allow evidence from either side which goes to prove or disprove that this song enraged those who... Now, gentlemen, since we have been in argument and debate for the past four hours, I think it is high time this case began. Let us swear in the jury and make a start. As a result of his lordship's ruling, you will have benefit of considerable testimony to assist you. But at the end of the day, the decision will be yours and yours alone. You each have a copy of this song, and I venture to submit that when you retire to consider your verdict, you will arrive at the conclusion, one might say the inescapable conclusion, that the words complained of are blasphemous and that the defendants are guilty as charged. Now, with your Lordship's permission, I will call the first witness. I call Dr. Ruth Wilkins. Dr. Ruth Wilkins. What is your religion? I'm a member of the Church of England. Take the Bible in your right hand and read aloud the words on this card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You are Dr. Ruth Wilkins of 3 Thorley Grove, Fulchester? Yes. And you are a medical doctor? I'm a general practitioner. Are you married? Yes, I am. How long have you been married? Nearly 19 years. And would you describe it as a happy marriage? Yes, I would. A very happy marriage. Mr. Willard, <clears throat> while I'm sure the jury will join me in congratulating Dr. Wilkins on her happy marriage, I think we would like to know what bearing this has on the real issues of this trial. My lord, I am anticipating a particular line the defence may take. Really? Yes, my lord. Thank you, Mr. Uh, do you have any children, Dr. Wilkins? Yes, I have a boy of 15 and a girl of 13. Now, I would like to come to the events that led to this prosecution, events that occurred on the, the afternoon of Saturday, July the 23rd last year. Uh, would you tell my lord and the jury, in your own words, what happened that afternoon? Well, there was going to be a pop concert at Fulchester Central Park. The children wanted to go, so Stephen and I decided to take him. Would Stephen be your happily married husband? Yes, my lord. Uh, please continue, Dr. Wilkins. The uh, main attraction be are those two people in the dock. The defendants, John Barnard and Julie Gilmore. Yes, yes, that's right. I mean, there were <coughs> other singers and groups performing, but the majority of people had come to see them. Were there many people in the park? Oh, it was packed. I think, I think the police estimated there was, well, between 15 and 20,000 people. The final act, that was Mr. Barnard. Yes, singing and uh, playing with his group. <laughs> when he finished, everybody stood up and cheered for encores. Hundreds of people standing and shouting for more songs. Then he called Miss Gilmore onto the stage and they sang that blasphemous song. Dr. Wilkins, we have yet to establish that the song <coughs> is blasphemous. That is why we are here. Your personal feelings and beliefs are one thing and I have no objection to you expressing them. You understand I wish to be fair. I'm grateful for that, my lord. I meant to the defendant, Dr. Wilkins. Your views on whether or not this song is blasphemous will carry no lesser or greater weight than any other person giving evidence. Continue, Mr. Willard. No, thank you, my lord. The song you refer to is entitled, Such is the Kingdom of Heaven. Yes, it is. Yes. Could the witness be shown Exhibit 1?
Thank you. Are those the words they sang on the afternoon of Saturday, the 23rd of July last year? Yes, yes, they are. What were your feelings when you heard those words being sung? It was something, uh, something akin to mental rape. I was very upset and appalled. And then, I'm afraid, I, I became very angry. What did you do? I tried to find a policeman as quickly as I could. There were plenty about because at the pop concert. I complained to him about the song. I asked him to arrest the defendants for singing an obscene song. He said if I had any complaints to make, I should go to the uh, Central Row Police Station and make a complaint to the desk sergeant. And that is what you did? No. No, firstly I went backstage and confronted the two defendants. Why did you do that? Well, I felt something had to be done at once, while there were still young people shouting for them to sing more songs. I spoke to Mr. Bernard. I told him how angry and upset I was that he'd sung such a song. I asked him to um, go to the microphone and to apologise publicly for singing such a song. He was very rude, very, very offensive. And I was hustled away by his road managers. Road managers, Mr. Willard? Uh, yes, my lord. Uh, road managers are employed by pop stars. One of their functions is to keep people away from the stars. A curious profession. Presumably, if they were entirely successful, the stars would no longer be stars. Indeed so, my lord. I'm beginning to wish we'd stay with the witnesses' happy marriage. Uh, did you then leave the scene of the pop concert? Yes, I went directly to the police station. Ah, now, without telling us what was said to you at the station, what uh, action did you subsequently take? Well, I initiated a private prosecution charging the two defendants with publishing blasphemous libel. Why did you do that, Dr Wilkins? Because the police were not prepared to do so. Because I'm a churchgoer. Because I believe in God and I believe in Jesus Christ. And I couldn't stand by why the beliefs that I and millions li like me hold sacred were insulted and, and vilified because I had to. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilkins. Usher, if you would relieve the witness of that exhibit, please. Uh, just a moment, Usher. I'd like uh, exhibit one handed back to Dr. Wilkins, please. Do you take it, please, Doctor? But, um, well, I've already verified that these are the words I heard on that Saturday. My Lord? I think counsel for the defendants may wish to examine you on the contents of that song. He may wish to take you through it word by word. Now, he can't do that unless you have a copy, can he? As his lordship has indicated, I shall shortly wish to question you about the content of the song. Uh, tell me, Dr. Wilkins, uh, are you a supporter of an organisation called the Festival of Light? With respect, my lord, that is surely totally irrelevant. My lord, will you hear me on this? Certainly, Mr. Charles. I find it curious that my learned friend should object to such a question. The very first question uh, that I put to the witness, we've heard this lady questioned about her happy marriage, her children, her church going, her religious beliefs, beliefs that she stated are shared by millions of people in this country. I assume that my learned friend considered all that information relevant. I know I did. He surely cannot object if I follow up the very line of questioning that he instigated. No, he cannot. Thank you, my lord. Well, doctor. Yes. Yes, I am a supporter of the organisation called the Nationwide Festival of Light. Now, the Festival of Light uh, have expressed views and opinions on a variety of subjects. Uh, tell me, uh, are there any areas of disagreement between your views and theirs? Well, I... I wouldn't think I'd agree with every word they say, but um, on the basic issues, yes, I do endorse their views. The basic issues. You therefore disapprove of homosexuality? Yes, I do. Now, early last year, the Festival of Light submitted a report to the Criminal Law uh, Revision Committee urging that the age of consent for homosexual practices should be raised from 21 to 24. Uh, would you agree with that recommendation? Yes. Yes, I would. You see, I think the vulnerability of our young should be protected. And I also think that the number of potential deviants would be reduced if the age of consent were raised. Would you perhaps like to see homosexual practices once more made completely illegal? Yes, I would. Why, Dr. Wilkins? <laughs> no, I'm not trying to evade that question, but I can't possibly give you a full answer here and now. 
You should come to my surgery and spend a week with me there. Listen to the confused, frightened teenagers I listen to. Discuss with the parents the wrecked and warped lives led by young men who lead homosexual lives. See the damage, sometimes irreparable, that happens to a young man who leads a so-called gay life. I assure you, Charles, it's nothing gay about it. Misery and a continual misery of better description. Oh, right. Maybe I am old-fashioned. Maybe I do believe in Christian values, but they work for me and they work for the other supporters of the Festival of Light. In keeping with those other supporters, uh, would you like to see stronger laws of censorship in the cinema, the theatre, advertising, broadcasting, literature? Yes, I would. What, all of them? Yes, yes, I would. Do you believe that the sexual education films in use in the schools in this country should be banned? I believe that some of the films and Victorian material shown in our school, material, if it was shown to the general public, would be liable to prosecution, should be banned. This country is riddled with moral pollution. We need new laws to clean up our society. And you seriously suggest that your organisation is the one to tackle the job? Well, I think we've got a very valuable contribution. <laughs> oh, I see, Sir Charles, you're amused. Now, I wonder if this would amuse you. Last year at the National Film Theatre in London, there was a film shown depicting a man copulating with a pig. Later on, the same man tried to commit suicide by eating his own excrement. Does that amuse you? With a pig, did you say, Doctor? Yes, my lord. Are you sure it was a pig? Yes, my lord. What was the title of this film? Wedding Trough. <clears throat> uh, how many members are there in the Festival of Light? Well, none. What? I mean, uh, there's a small committee, there's a, a, a staff, but it's not an organisation that you can join. Uh, how then does one judge the measure of support it enjoys with the general public? Well, by the size of their rallies, I think would be a good yardstick. In 1971, there were 35,000 people in Trafalgar Square. And later that evening, in Hyde Park, 80,000 people attended a service for Christian dedication. Those figures are Festival of Light estimates, are they not? Yes, they are. Uh, some uh, press figures for your more recent rallies are rather more conservative. Uh, for example, the 1976 rally, would I be right in saying that the B BBC's uh, estimate for the attendance was 5,000? Well, that's uh, their estimate. We dispute it. Now, as I understand it, Dr. Wilkins, um, apart from the uh, areas we've already covered, uh, the Festival of Light is also opposed to any attempts to legalise euthanasia. Yes. To abortion. To abortion on demand. And it would like it made more difficult to obtain a divorce. Yes. You see, I think that I, well, in the case I think it is for the jury to see, Dr. Wilkins. I think the witness might be allowed to qualify her answer, Sir Charles. If your lordship please. What were you going to say? Well, if I just give a bold yes or no to a question like that, I think, it, I think it's misleading. Take divorce, for example. Well, in this country, each year there are about, well, about 120,000 divorces involving an estimated 150,000 children. Now, the damage that those figures indicate is, is beyond comprehension. Well, we want to prevent that damage by asking the law to make it more difficult to obtain a divorce. Yes, I see. Mr. Child? Are you a supporter of Mary Whitehouse? Yes. Uh, Mary Whitehouse, my lord, is the honorary general secretary of an organization that began life as the Clean Up TV campaign and is now known as the National Viewers and Listeners Association. Uh, my lord, are we now to be subjected to an examination of Mary Whitehouse? I really don't know, Mr. Willard. Would you have any objections if we are? Well, my lord, I was under the impression that these were the two people on trial, not the Festival of Light and Mary Whitehouse. I think your impression is correct. It seems to me, my lord, that the Defence Council is, is, is trying to build a defence from pieces of straw by dragging into this trial irrelevant information. You object to these questions on the ground of irrelevance? I do, my lord. Child. 
Lord, I can only repeat what I said before. I'm merely following up a line of questioning uh, instigated by my learned friend. This witness initiated this trial. She received permission uh, judicially to circumvent a magistrate's hearing and bring her prosecution directly to this court. Her motives, her attitude, her views are of paramount importance to this trial. Indeed, it is because of her views about my client's song uh, that we are all here today. I do not think that the information that has so far been given to the jury can be described as matters of straw. One man's blasphemy is another man's work of art. I am seeking to establish the thinking, the reasoning, that has brought this witness to the conclusion that my client's song is blasphemous, to establish whether this prosecution was brought frivolously. This lady is the self-appointed spokesman of millions of silent Christians who would allegedly be outraged if they heard this song. My Lord, I submit that my clients have a fundamental right to have these questions put to the witness. And I must agree, Mr. Willard, in my view, the defence have every right to ascertain exactly how reasonable the witness is or why she considered this song blasphemous. The information so far elicited is highly pertinent to this issue. Would this song offend a reasonable Christian? A Christian on a clap omnibus, to paraphrase a well-known piece of judicial wisdom? It would appear to me that Sir Charles is attempting to discover, as I said before, exactly how reasonable this witness is. As your lordship pleases. I believe you were about to question the witness about Mrs. Mary Whitehouse. No? Yes, I was, Lord. I'm grateful. Um, uh, are you a member of that organisation? Yes, I am. Now, I have over the years seen many claims about its size and number of members. Uh, can you give me an exact figure? No, no, I'm afraid I can't give you an exact figure. I believe it's somewhere between, well, a million, million and a half. Oh, really? Uh, my Lord, I would like to submit this uh, newspaper cutting as Exhibit 2. I have a copy from the learned friend. Any objections, Mr. Willard? Uh, no, my Lord. Uh, the exhibit, uh, as you will see, Dr. Wilkins, is a copy of an article in the Times newspaper published on the 31st of October, 1977. And among other details, it gives the membership figure as 31,000. Uh, it's a bit short of a million and a half, isn't it? Are you aware that the campaign for real ale has almost as many members? Really, my lord? I, I, I withdraw the question. Now, as a member of uh, Mrs. Whitehouse's organisation, do you find yourself in agreement with the various uh, comments and uh, protests that she has made over the years? Well, naturally, otherwise I wouldn't be a member of her organisation. No, 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 of course not. Now, uh, could we turn, please, uh, to the song entitled Such is the Kingdom of Heaven? I would like to go through it with you to establish exactly what your objections are. Oh, do pick it up, Doctor. It won't bite. Now, the first verse. What are your objections to that? Anything there that you find obnoxious to your religious beliefs? In the first verse, the four lines containing the sexual references to God and the Virgin Mary, I find disgusting. I object to all of it. I find the whole song outrageous. Oh, uh, well, let us take the second verse. The second verse is, I understand, known as the middle eight, because it has a different rhythm or metre from the rest of the song. Uh, my lord, with your permission, I would like to read it aloud. Yes, you may, Sir Charles. I, um, I would warn the gentlemen of the press who are present that the Law of Libel Amendment Act of 1888 does not authorise publication of any portion of allegedly blasphemous matter that is the subject of court proceedings. I am not, of course, instructing you that you may not report this, uh, this song in your reports of this trial, I'm merely pointing out to you the perils of doing so. Now, very well, in the middle eight. Suffer little children to come unto you, Christ, how they suffer, they suffer in scores, in Saigon and Hanoi, in dozens of wars, in Uganda, in Belfast, in Cape Town, in Greece, they die in their thousands while you reign in peace. Such is the kingdom of heaven. Such is the kingdom of heaven. Does that outrage you, Dr. Wilkin? Of course I've got... Of course I've got no objection for him attacking the cruelty of war and the suffering of children. But to say, as he does in that verse, 
that Jesus Christ is indifferent to that suffering, that, in my opinion, is blasphemous. Uh, well, uh, the next verse. You died to redeem us, O Christ, what a waste. Blasphemer, blasphemer, repent not in haste. It wasn't your legs but your ego that tripped on the Calvary march when your crucifix slipped. Oh, that's so wicked, so evil, so, so appalling. He's talking about the Son of God, the Son of God. The crucifixion of our Lord is held by millions and millions of people throughout the world as a divine, sacred, inspirational act. He dismisses it, derides it. I've not brought up two children to have them exposed to obscenities like that. The permissives feel that they have a right to impose upon the rest of us, the majority of us, anything that their sick minds can conjure up. Pornography, obscenities, deviations of all kinds run rife in this country, completely unchecked. <laughs> Christian values and ethics are now no longer just considered old-fashioned. The permissives wish to destroy them. The Christian faith has not lasted for nearly 2,000 years to be ridiculed by a pop singer. No, I'm not fighting to protect my children from this filth. I am fighting to destroy it. Yes, well, it is up to the jury to see how far you succeed in that destruction. Now, the last verse. God is dead, we are told, by the scribes who are here. Well, if that is so, we have nothing to fear. An end to our hurt and an end to our pain. What's that you say? Mary is pregnant again? Now, you're quite right, Sir Charles. It's up to the jury to decide. I have nothing more to say about that song. No, well, you've already said a good deal. You described it as filthy, you described it as obscene, wicked, evil, disgusting. You said it was blasphemous and outraged your Christian beliefs. And yet I put it to you, Dr. Wilkins, that at that concert th that you attended in Fulchester Park, where this song was sung by the defendants, the song was demanded by many thousands of that audience, that they stood there chanting, calling out for my clients to sing this song, and that further. Among those people standing there shouting and demanding that they sing such is the kingdom of heaven, among those people was you. That you stood calling out to the stage, calling out to my clients to sing this song. That, that's a lie. Join us again tomorrow when the case of the Queen against Bernard and Gilmore will be resumed in the Crown Court. The case you're about to see and the characters portrayed are fictional, but the procedure is legally accurate. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the general public. As a result of a song performed at a Fulchester Pop concert, Ruth Wilkins, a local doctor, has brought a private prosecution against the singers John Barnard and Julie Gilmore. They're charged with publishing a blasphemous libel, commonly known as blasphemy. They pleaded not guilty. Yesterday, we heard from Dr. Wilkins about the events at the concert. We rejoined the trial as a local Anglican vicar, the Reverend Walter, a witness for the prosecution, is about to give evidence. That's correct. I've been vicar at St. John's for some four years. Do you have a youth centre at the church? Yes, we do. A very active one. Could you briefly describe some of the activities of that youth centre? Well, there are the usual activities, such as table tennis, uh, dancing, drama, 
organised outings. Then we run some uh, discussion groups and a volunteer group to help the aged in the area. I would like to question you about a particular discussion group that took place on the 25th of July last year. Do you recall that particular one? I most certainly do. What would be the age range of the young people in that discussion group? 13 to 19, our teenager group. My Lord, I'd like to make an offer to my learned friend. Really? And what would that be, Sir John? I am prepared to waive the hearsay rule with respect to this witness. You are? Well, I, I realise my learned friend would like to question the witness about exactly what was said at that discussion group. In order to do this, it would be necessary for him to call a number of the young men and women who took part in order to corroborate the Reverend Gentleman's version. Now, I have no objection to this, of course. I merely want to save the court's time. But having read uh, Mr. Walter's original deposition, I am perfectly confident that his evidence alone can give a fair and adequate gist of what was said. That's a very handsome offer, Sir Charles. And what do you say, Mr. Willard? I accept it, my lord. It does mean that a number of potential witnesses can be released. Mm. May I express my gratitude to my learned friend? You, um, you might be wondering what all that was about. Uh, normally, this witness would not be allowed to give evidence about what other people said in that discussion group. In this case, however, that rule has been waived. Well, I'm obliged, my lord. Uh, Mr. Walter, what was the topic of conversation on the evening in question? Well, we had planned to discuss the uh, problem of teenage unemployment. Well, did something happen to change that plan? Well, the, the something had already happened on the previous Saturday at Fulchester Central Park. Are you referring to the pop concert given by the two defendants? Yes, I am. Yes, how did that affect your group discussion? When I entered the room, there was a, a raging argument in full swing. They were all talking about the song, For Such is the Kingdom of Heaven. Mm. Could the witness be shown Exhibit 1, please? Thank you. Now, is that the same song that was uh, being discussed? Yes, it is. Mr Walter, have you had an opportunity to study that song before giving evidence today? Yes, I have. Would you consider it blasphemous? I consider it highly blasphemous. Did it outrage you? To be absolutely honest, I don't think I felt outraged. What did you feel then? I was hurt and shocked. I felt that the song vilified my personal Christian faith. Mm. Uh, to return to that discussion group, you said just now that when you entered the room, a, a raging argument was in full swing. Would you tell my lord and the jury what subsequently took place? Uh, well, after I quietened them down, I eventually... Uh, established what the reason for the argument was. Uh, most of them had been to the concert on the previous Saturday and saw those two people sing this song. Some of the group were very upset and angry and uh, critical of the song. Others were defending it. Apparently, after the song had been sung, uh, one of my discussion group, uh, a young man of 18, uh, had to be restrained by some of the others. He uh, wanted to climb up onto the stage and thump Mr Barnard. The defendant? Yes. Some of the group thought that thumping the singer was hardly a Christian act and believed that Mr Barnard had a right to express his opinions. They also felt that it gave them food for thought. The words of the song, that is. Uh, others were very, very distressed by the song. Can you elaborate on that? They took the words as a personal insult. A not dissimilar reaction to your own? Oh, indeed. And these youngsters hadn't had the benefit of years of study of the history of blasphemy. Theirs was a, a simple reaction. Were you able, during the course of the subsequent discussion, to allay their fears about this song? No, I wasn't able to. I still am not able to. Mr Walter, thank you very much. Thank you. You were unable to allay the anxieties of some in that discussion group about this song. That's correct. Could this possibly be because of some fault or deficiency within yourself rather than the content of the song? Oh, well, there's no possibility about it. That most certainly is the reason. Well, I'm obliged. Mr. Oh, Walter. you don't have to be. I doubt that I'd have been able to give adequate comfort if uh, some of the female members of the group had been physically raped. Do you really put the alleged mental violation they experienced on that part? Yes, I do. Except that in the case of some of those young people, the damage might never heal. 
You gave evidence at the beginning of your testimony that while you were training for the church, you made an extensive study of the history of blasphemy. That's right, yes. What conclusion did you reach about the laws of this country covering the crime of blasphemy? That we as a nation should do one of two things. Either abolish the crime of blasphemy or extend it to cover the whole spectrum of religions practiced in this country. And of course, the law as it stands only protects the Christian religion, does it not? That's right, yes. Do you think that God and Jesus, as you conceive them to be, need the protection of the law? No, of course they don't, but uh, people who are practicing Christians might well do. You would say that God is well able to look after himself? Yes, I would. But unlike God, those people in that discussion group, for example, might need a little help. You told my learned friend that you considered this song highly blasphemous. That's right. Uh, would you refer to the copy of the song you have there? And would you have any objection to reading aloud the middle eight? The middle eight? The second verse. Oh, oh, no, not at all. I'll read the entire song aloud, if you wish. I think all counsel need at the moment is just the second verse. Uh, thank you, my lord. If you would be so kind, Mr. Walter. <clears throat> suffer little children to come unto you. Christ, how they suffer. They suffer in scores in Saigon and Hanoi, in dozens of wars. In Uganda, in Belfast, in Cape Town, in Greece, they die in their thousands while you reign in peace. Such is the kingdom of heaven, such is the kingdom of heaven. Do you dispute that in some of the places mentioned, thousands of children have died and are dying? Certainly not. And have suffered? And have suffered, most certainly. Do you think it wrong for my clients publicly to protest against such obscenity? Not at all, I heartily agree. Where I would take issue with them is in the fact that they, they seem to be blaming God for those atrocities. I would blame man. Who is made in the image of God? Indeed he is, but God gave him freedom of choice. If man chooses to kill or cause suffering, one can't blame God. Not even in Belfast? Not even in Belfast. When a, when a child is gunned down in Northern Ireland, it's a man's hand on the trigger, not God's. The situation in Northern Ireland has often been described as a religious war. Would you accept that definition? I accept that many men and women and children use the label religious war to justify the unjustifiable. It seems to be a very unholy war to me. Would you look for a moment at the first verse of the song? Uh, what do you find blasphemous about that? A number of things, uh, principally the sexual reference to the Virgin Mary and God. Yeah, may the witness see Exhibit 3, please. <coughs> that is a copy of the authorised version of the Bible, is it not? Yes, it is. Uh, I propose to read some passages from it, from the Song of Solomon, uh, which I think you'll find uh, begins on page 708. I don't propose to read the whole book, just some extracts uh, that I believe to be fairly representative of the whole. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. Thy two breasts are like young roes that are twins which feed among the lilies. My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. The joints of thy thighs are like jewels. Thy navel is like a round goblet. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Uh, would you say that those extracts were a fair representation of the whole book? Yes, I would. Now, as I understand it, Mr. Walter, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the Church believes that those extracts, together with the rest of the book, is the Word of God, is divinely inspired. That's correct. I would suggest to you that what I have just read, together with the rest of the Song of Solomon, is candidly erotic. <laughs> yes, of course it is. In fact, there's even more erotic symbolism than appears on the surface. Those words speak of sexual love, and reading them is likely to arouse sexual desire and excitement. Would you accept that? Certainly I would. And those are divinely inspired words? 
they're accepted by the church as such. Then surely, Mr. Walter, if the concept of blasphemy is to have any meaning, to attribute such sentiments to Almighty God is the most profound example of blasphemy imaginable. The Song of Songs has caused difficulty for the church from early times because of its erotic character. Many interpreters take the position that because erotic poetry can't be found in a sacred and inspired book, then the words must have another meaning. There are many, many interpretations as to what that other meaning is. I put it to you, Mr. Walter, that the language of the Song of Solomon is distasteful to many modern ears, perhaps even to some people in this court. I wouldn't disagree with that. Different historical times produce different standards. So we have a situation where erotic sexual references in the Bible are sacred, and a non-erotic sexual reference in my client's song is blasphemy. Is that your position? Yes, it is. Of course, if the church ruled that the words written by your client were divinely inspired, then they wouldn't be blasphemous. Until that unlikely event occurs, there's no doubt in my mind that this song is one of the worst examples of blasphemy I've ever read. My lord, that is the case for the prosecution. Uh, may it please you, my lord, I immediately call my first witness, uh, Miss Julie Gilmore, please. What is your religion? You won't find it in any church. Do you wish to affirm? Yes. I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, Miss Gilmore, how long have you been singing professionally? About nine years. And during that period, you've been awarded five gold discs, is that correct? Yes. Now, my lord, a gold disc is awarded when the sales of a particular single record reach half a million. Uh, Ms. Gilmore, have your professional appearances been confined to this country? No, I've worked all over the world, mainly here in the States, but I've done a number of world tours. And prior to the Fulchester concert, have you, had you ever worked with John Barnard before? Oh, yes, many times. Uh, have any of those appearances resulted in criminal charges being brought against you? No, of course not. No. Now, with regard to the Fortress concert, will you please tell my lord and the jury in your own words what happened when the audience began demanding an encore from John Barnard? I was standing just off stage. Johnny called out, hey, what about doing the kingdom? I went on and sang the song with him. Uh, we'd arranged with the local authorities that we'd close the show at a certain time, by then, we'd run past that. The crowd were yelling out to, for more, but we thanked them all for coming, told them to pick up any rubbish lying around, and said we hoped we'd see them all again soon. This was a free concert, wasn't it? I mean, there was no charge for admission. Not a cent. And uh, the song, such as The Kingdom of Heaven, had you ever sung it before? Yes, a number of times. Johnny wrote it a few months before this particular concert. We've often finished shows singing it together. And on these other occasions when you sang it together, were there ever any complaints? Only when we refused to sing it a second time. It was popular with the fans, was it? The single was selling nicely, nothing sensational. Not until this trouble, then it took off. Uh, Miss Gilmore, pardon my obtuseness, but could you clarify that statement? Uh, well, John had released the song as a single record, not part of an album. It was selling moderately well. Then this business at Fulchester Park hit the press was reported in the newspapers. In two weeks, the single had sold half a million copies. Then Dr. Wilkins got an injunction preventing further sales till this case was resolved. I see. Did you have anything to do with the words or the music? I only wish I had. I think it's a great song, an important song. It's saying something that needs to be said. Miss Gilmore, do you consider it to be blasphemous? No, I don't. Though I do consider the killing of children, of young people, of any people, not only blasphemous, but obscene. 
anything that helps to reduce that killing and maiming, anything that makes people stop and think for a moment, that helps to raise their level of consciousness, must be a force for good. If this God that Dr. Wilkins is so anxious to protect is that weak and impotent that he needs her help, I'm not surprised we're in such a mess on this planet. I'm not ashamed that I sang that song. In fact, I'm rather proud. Thank you, Miss Gilmore. You're rather proud of singing that song, are you? Yes, I am. Are you uh, as equally as proud of the fact that you and your co-defendant distressed and outraged a considerable number of people at that concert? Before this trial began, I was under the impression that the only person we'd upset was Dr. Wilkins. You've heard the evidence of the Re Reverend Edward Walter. Well, I haven't been sunbathing in Bermuda for the past two days. My Lord, I request that the witness be asked to answer that question. Miss Gilmore, Mr. Willard is merely attempting to establish a fact. I'm sorry. It just seems rather a tedious question. Well, having sat on this bench for many years and suffered a great deal of tedium, you have my sympathy. However, I do feel the question deserves an answer. Yes. I heard the vicar's evidence about members of his discussion group who were upset by the song. I will therefore ask you again, are you proud that you distressed and angered those young people? Well, if it made them stop and think about reality... My Lord, I request that the witness be asked to refrain from prevarication. Oh, really, my Lord, I must object to this hectoring of Miss Gilman. I think you might allow the young lady to finish her answer. It may not be the one you are seeking, and that is one of the perils of advocacy. Sometimes the ball is returned more smartly than the service. You were going to say? That if they were made to stop and think about reality by that song, then I am very proud to have sung it. Even if it hurt and distressed them? Reality, when faced, often hurts and distresses all of us. The fact that by singing that song you outraged people, appalled them, offended their deeply held religious beliefs, none of that worries you. What worries me is that people like Dr. Wilkins are seemingly preoccupied with obscenity, pornography, blasphemy. Instead of being occupied with the obscenity of war, the pornography of modern politics, the blasphemy of suffering that organized religion imposes on millions. Those are the things that worry me. Do they worry you? I'm not here to engage in debate with you. I'm well aware of that. I could hardly have a dialogue with a man who's emotionally deaf. Miss Gilmer, I must ask you to refrain from making personal remarks like that. He can ask me personal questions, but I can't make personal replies. You seem well able to cope without resorting to personal insult. The world you move in, Miss Gilmore, the, the pop world, the values, ethics and morals of that world are, are somewhat different to those of the general public, are they not? I really don't know. It would be as logical to presume that the values, ethics and morals of members of the legal profession are somewhat different from those of the general public. The world of drugs, of loose morals, casual relationships. Really? I had no idea the legal profession was like that. Talking about your world, Miss Gilmore. Yes, of course, those things exist in the pop world. They also exist in the legal world, the medical world, the engineering world. They exist. We don't have a monopoly on them, you know. It's just that it makes a better story when a pop scandal breaks. It sells more newspapers. People in Fleet Street do naughty things, too. It's just that rival editors are disinclined to publish stories about them. Miss Gilmore, when you took the stand, you declined to take the oath. Uh, Lord, I really must object in the strongest terms. Miss Gilmore had every right to affirm. Brave men in the last century fought long and exhausting battles for her to have that right. I submit that it is quite improper of my learned friend to question her as to why she affirmed. My Lord, I merely wish to ask the witness about a remark she made to the clerk before she affirmed when she said, you won't find my religion in any church. Uh, my Lord, in view of the, the fact that the remark in question was made before she affirmed and was not therefore the subject of any question from me, I submit that my learned friend has once more entered the area of improper cross-examination. I agree with you, Sir Charles. Yes, Mr. Willard. Miss Gilmore, are you a practicing Christian? Yes, I am. A member of the Church of England? No, I'm not a member of any organized religion. Uh, yeah. I was, but not now. Yet you consider yourself a practicing Christian? Yes, I do. 
The place to practice it isn't inside a church, it's out in the streets in our everyday to day relationships with others. That's my form of Christianity. Oh, and a part of your form of Christianity is singing songs like Such is the Kingdom of Heaven to young and vulnerable people. Yes, it is. I have no further questions. Thank you, Miss Gilmore. And neither council has seen fit to question you about a particular incident which I feel the jury might like to hear more about. I refer to what happened between Mr. Barnard and Dr. Watkins, uh, Dr. Wilkins, after the concert had finished. Now, I am referring to the time after you had both sung the song that is complained about. Uh, were you present when Dr. Wilkins appeared backstage? Yes, I was. And can you recall any of the conversation that took place? She was very upset, very angry. She began shouting at both of us. Purveyors of filth was one of her phrases. She demanded that John should go back on stage and apologize because we'd sung an obscene song. Well, John tried to calm her down, find out exactly what was upsetting her. It was futile. She was so angry, she was virtually incoherent. Well, John was very tired. We both were. It had been a long day. Some of John's staff asked her to leave. She refused to. John and I left. I think his road managers dealt with her. Join us again tomorrow when the case of the Queen against Barnard and Gilmore will be concluded in the Crown Court. The case you're about to see and the characters portrayed are fictional, but the procedure is legally accurate. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the general public, who will retire at the end of the trial to reach their own unrehearsed verdict. Ruth Wilkins, a local Fulchester doctor, has brought a private prosecution against two pop singers, John Barnard and Julie Gilmore. They're charged with publishing a blasphemous libel, commonly known as blasphemy. They've pleaded not guilty. The prosecution has sought to show that the song would outrage practicing Christians and vilify the Christian religion. Counsel for the defence has called John Bernard to the witness box. Mr Barnard, uh, where were you born? Belfast. Well, uh, how long have you been singing professionally? About ten years. And during that time am I right in saying that you have acquired an international reputation? Well, there seem to be quite a few people who like my music. You've had number one hit records in many countries. Yes, I have. Eleven gold discs. Yes. You've also written the words and music for a number of films. Yes. Two stage shows which were highly successful. Uh, will you tell the Lord and the jury how you came to write Such is the Kingdom of Heaven, the song that brings you to this court today? There are so many reasons. I suppose it would come under the broad heading of a protest song. Tell me, Mr. Barnard, did you write many protest songs? That's not an easy question to answer. In the conventional meaning of protest, probably not. Usually my work's on a more personal level. Protesting about the betrayal of a particular human relationship, for example. When you wrote this particular song, what did you want to protest about? About the way that the innocents are exploited, maimed, killed by the rest of us, about the way that Christianity has been perverted to suit ambition. I was also exploring the possibility that we might, we just might be better off without the whole damn thing. Better off without Christianity? Without organized Christianity, without the Church of Christ. It wasn't a spur of the moment thing. I wasn't knocking it off because I felt it was time to get another single out. It had been a long time coming. It started to come when I was a child. 
in Belfast. Yes. Could you elaborate on that? Every day I hear people saying that the troubles in Northern Ireland are not based on religious conflict. And of course, most of the people who hold that view were not born there. I've never lived there. And they're not likely to go there. There's also a lot of talk about getting the British out of Ireland. You know the kind of thing. If the British would get out of Ireland, the problems of the Irish would be resolved. I believe that if God would get out of Ireland, there'd be no problem to resolve. In what part of Belfast were you born? In the Falls Road, at a segregated hospital. Uh, what do you mean by a segregated hospital? A hospital for Catholics only. In Ulster, it's not a question of black and white, it's orange and green. And the area where you grew up, was that segregated too? Completely. In my youth, there were a few Protestant families in the neighborhood, not any longer. Each side has its own housing areas, its own schools, its own games, its own parks. You're not taught to hate Protestants. It's more subtle than that. You're told it's best if you don't mix with them. I'm talking about my own experiences as a young child, you understand? Yes. And out of that childhood grew the seeds of a song called Such is the Kingdom of Heaven. Yes. The church was everywhere and into everything. Their church as well as ours. All believing, apparently, in the same Jesus Christ. And all doing their best to re-murder him a dozen times a day. The church is involved in your life at every level there, and it corrupts at every level. I'm talking about all denominations. It's no go humanity. It's no go compassion. It's no go understanding. It's no go sanity. It's no go. Mr. Barnard, do you consider your song to be blasphemous? No. What it's talking about is blasphemous. In the case of Belfast, what the IRA are doing under the label of Catholic and what the UVF are doing under the banner of Protestant, that's blasphemous. If we could get God out of the way, who knows? Maybe the people would be able to look into each other's eyes and eventually see something other than fear and hatred. When did you leave Northern Ireland? When I was 17, I go back every year, though. Perhaps Dr. Wilkins would like to come with me and clean up Belfast. <laughs> My lord, might the witness be asked to confine himself to answering the questions? I think you're being oversensitive, Mr. Willard. Was there any particular incident that influenced you to write this song? A number of incidents, actually, but there was... There was one that outraged and appalled me in much the same way that I presumably outraged and appalled Dr. Wilkins. A few years ago, a friend of mine, young Canadian, he came to live in Belfast. He'd read about what was going on, like most of the rest of the world has, and he wanted to see for himself. More importantly, he wanted to find out if there was anything he could do to help. He was a teacher, and it had occurred to him in Toronto that he might be more usefully employed in Belfast. I met him on a tour of Canada. Next time I saw him was in my own city. He was trying to start adventure playgrounds. They were going to be integrated for all creeds. I helped him out with some money, and Julie and I and some of our friends, we put on a concert, gave the proceeds to the adventure playground. He managed to find a clear piece of ground without too much trouble. There's lots of clear pieces of ground in Belfast these days. He got builders, got equipment, did it all, virtually single-handed. At first he had trouble getting the children to mix. What would happen would be that the Catholics would come on Monday and the Protestant children would come on a Tuesday. And he'd talk to the parents and somehow broke down some of the resistance to the idea. The children started to mix. He got married. I remember talking to him at the wedding reception. He was so excited, so eager, full of plans for opening up integrated adventure playgrounds all over the city. The day after his wedding, he was at the playground, 
surrounded by dozens of children. Three masked men got out of a car. They walked across the playground and shot him. He died. Yes, you could say it was because of incidents like that that I wrote this song. Mr. Barnard, thank you very much indeed. I have no questions, my lord. Thank you, Mr. Barnard. I find your testimony very moving. How relevant is another matter. <laughs> so, after some 15 years working in Fleet Street and a variety of national newspapers, you returned to Fulchester. Yes, that's right. I've been seen a reporter on the Fulchester Echo for the past five years. Yes, I would like to come to the afternoon of July the 23rd of last year. Did you attend the pop concert in Fulchester Park? Yes, I did. We, the paper, ran a large feature article on Mr. Barnard and Miss Gilmer. Uh, tell me, Mr. Glencoe, at any time did you see any signs of disturbance, of unrest, of violence? Apart from an incident right in the end uh, involving Dr. Wilkins, not at all. Very happy, gentle afternoon. Music and weather were good. And I understand there are only two, and two arrests during the entire afternoon. Uh, so apart from those isolated incidents and the matter of Dr. Wilkins that we'll come to in a moment, it was a trouble-free afternoon. My Lord, I must object. How can the witness possibly have been in contact with some 20,000 people throughout the afternoon? Yes, I would allow that objection. Uh, very well. Uh, let, let us come directly to the period of the afternoon when you observed Dr. Wilkins and her family. What did you do? I sensed a story. I moved over and stood by them. Was this the famous sixth sense of the fourth estate? No, in this instance, I can't claim that. I've done a number of pieces on Dr. Wilkins. Now, with regard to Dr. Wilkins and her family, what occurred before the defendant sang such as the Kingdom of Heaven? Uh, Mr. Barnard had finished singing and had said goodbye to the audience. And the audience were disinclined to say goodbye to, them, to him. They began chanting for more, and the Wilkins family joined in the chanting. A lot of people were calling for John to sing such as the Kingdom of Heaven. Among these people were the Wilkins family. You are absolutely certain of that? Yes, quite sure. What happened next? Shortly after that, the two defendants sang the song. When it was over, I heard uh, Dr. Wilkins say to her husband, I'm going to tell those two what I think of them. I followed them round to the back of the stage. She began shouting at them demanding that they go back on stage and apologize for singing an obscene song. You're quite sure of this? Yes, I was taking shorthand notes of it all. The two singers tried to reason with her. She refused to listen. Kept demanding that they uh, make a public apology. She became hysterical, told them they were purveyors of filth, and some of Barnard's stuff escorted her from the stage. So you sold this story of your version of what transpired? I've already told you I did. You made money from it? Yes, the same way as you're making money from it now. Mr. Glencoe, that is an objectionable remark. Sorry. I put it to you that for the past five years you have been waging a vendetta against Dr. Wilkins. I wouldn't call it a vendetta. Then what would you call it? I've written a number of articles about Dr. Wilkins. We've also run many news stories on her activities. Capitalising on the stand she has chosen to make against aspects of our society. Look, you can't keep the lady off the phone every time she sees a TV play she doesn't like, every time a film is shown she disagrees with. She's not in my newspaper making her views known. Has Dr. Wilkins ever complained about any of the articles you've written about her? Well, she complains about many things. Yes, from time to time she complained. We publish her complaints too. What are your personal opinions as to her views? You mean her views about the various TV plays and films she's criticised? Yes. Sometimes I've agreed with her, sometimes I've disagreed with her. Is it not a fact, Mr Glencoe, that you have over the years uh, written numerous articles that have been extremely hostile towards the organisation known as the National Viewers and Listeners Association? Not hostile, critical. You have also attacked from time to time the Festival of Light. You will use such emotive words, Mr Willard. Not attacked, criticised. You have accused Dr. Wilkins of paranoia. Would you call that fair comment? No, I'd call it the truth. That was in an article about Mrs. Mary Whitehouse. After that lady had said there was a political and ideological conspiracy centred in the BBC to undermine the British way of life. What nonsense. So you think that what these ladies and that organisation stands for is nonsensical? When she complains, 
about a pop record called Ding-a-Ling. He says that it is intended as a deliberate stimulation to self and mutual masturbation. When she denounces the wife of a former president of the United States because that lady had the temerity to express her views on premarital sex which disagreed with hers. When she says that the predominance of men on the broadcasting council is the reason for standards that are lower than the general communities. When she claims to have secretly vetted potential TV programs at the invitation at producers and had items cut and refuse it to name the programs concerned, when she says and does these things, and many more I could name you if you wish, yes, I do think they are indeed nonsensical. Well, the jury will be the judge of that. Whatever the veracity of your story about the incidents involving Dr. Wilkins at the pop concert, it was carried by many of the national newspapers. It certainly was. As a result, this song received massive publicity, and this sickening blasphemy has been exposed to millions of people. Without her intervention at the pop concert, without the rumpus she caused, I'd never have mentioned the song. It didn't strike me as blasphemous. Still doesn't. I'd gone there to write an article about the entire pop concert, not just one song. It would be a feature article. Her actions made it a news story. A story, by the way, that carried an interview with Dr. Wilkins that she very happily gave me. In fact, she telephoned my office three times after I'd interviewed her, asked if I wanted any more quotes. If anybody's responsible for the record selling half a million copies, surely it's Dr. Wilkins. You have a degree in law and are in your final year of study for a degree in divinity. That is correct. Uh, were you at the pop concert in Fulchester Park on the afternoon of July the 23rd last? Yes, I was. I was present throughout the concert. And did you at any time see or hear signs of unrest from any member of the audience? No. No, it was a very happy afternoon as far as I was concerned. My Lord, is the witness speaking on behalf of all 20,000 people who were present at the concert? My Lord, I was referring to my own personal experiences and observations. Precisely. Are you having difficulty in hearing the witness, Mr. Willard? Uh, no, my lord. Uh, did you hear the song that closed the concert? Such is the kingdom of heaven. Yes. Yes, I did. Uh, did you find the words of it blasphemous? No, I didn't. As a Christian and an active member of the Church of England, I find them refreshing. They aroused in you no feelings of outrage? Outrage? With regard to my personal faith? No, they don't. Outrage with regard to what the words are saying about some aspects of our society Yes. I think they hit a few nails right on the head. And after the song had been performed, did you observe any hostile or critical reaction from any section of the audience? No. Everyone around me was calling out for more. Uh, to be specific about the degree for which you are at present studying, would I be right in saying that it's an MA in theology? Yes, with particular reference to church law. Uh, does that involve you in uh, studying the crime of blasphemy? Yes complete with the range of anomalies that pertain. Anomalies? I'm afraid I don't understand you, Mr. Hodgson. Uh, could you elaborate? Well, it's difficult to know where to begin. I suppose the greatest anomaly is the fact that Jesus Christ, the founder of our faith, was crucified for his blasphemy. And yet mankind in this country felt the need in the 17th century to protect Christ and the Christian faith by making blasphemy a crime. Of course, long before then and ever since, Christians have been free to blaspheme any other religion or faith. That double standard has been with us ever since. Could you give us a few examples of what you have called that double standard? Well, this law of blasphemy has been used in the past to suppress the writings of men such as Tom Paine, Shelley, and yet uh, St. Francis of Avila was happily allowed to write lines such as fornicate with my soul upon a bed of thorns, O Lord. St. John of the Cross was free to write, O flame of love, your fiery probe, for your sweet encounter tear the robe. Those two got sanctified. Yes, of course, these examples are not contemporary. If you want modern examples of the double standard that applies to blasphemy, you don't have to look far. Uh, take a very successful musical like Jesus Christ Superstar. It could be argued the title itself is blasphemous. Yes? Well, King Herod sings to Jesus in that musical, so you are the Christ, you are great Jesus Christ. Prove to me you're no fool, walk across my swimming pool. Uh, then there's another line in that, uh, prove to me you're divine, change my water into wine. 
Any more? Catherine Whitehall, writing in The Observer, called God a male chauvinist pig. Uh, Nancy Bank Smith, writing in The Guardian a few months ago, said of Jesus Christ, it was, one feels, a failure of tactics to be born on Christmas Day and die on Good Friday. Uh, these are the only two days of the year on which there are no papers. Do you find these modern examples that you've quoted blasphemous? No, I don't. What puzzles me is why prosecutions are brought, like this one, against a serious song and not against the examples I've just quoted. I don't need any law of blasphemy to protect my faith. I don't believe any Christian needs such a law. We have heard much during the course of this trial about the views of Dr. Wilkins, of the views of Mrs. Mary Whitehouse. We've heard about the nationwide festival of light of the National Viewers and Listeners Association, of the troubles in Ireland, of pop songs called Ding-a-Ling. I put it to you that in the final analysis you can safely put all of those things from your minds. We are here solely to ascertain whether or not these two defendants are guilty of publishing a blasphemous libel. Now the law says and in this case, as in all others, you will take the law from his lordship, that it is no defence with regard to the crime of blasphemy to prove that the words complained of are true or that the publication of those words is for the public benefit. If the decencies of controversy are observed, even the fundamentals of Christianity may be attacked without committing the offence of blasphemy. I submit that this song does not observe those decencies. I believe the last such trial as this was in 1921 when a man was sentenced to nine months imprisonment for publishing a pamphlet in which he described Jesus Christ as looking like a circus clown when he entered Jerusalem on a donkey. Well, I doubt if such a remark today would provoke a prosecution we live in more enlightened times. But I venture to suggest that the blasphemy contained in this song, Such is the Kingdom of Heaven, is a thousand times worse. I urge you to take those copies with you when you retire to consider your verdict. I submit that the only conclusion you will be able to arrive at after due deliberation is that the defendants are guilty of publishing a blasphemous libel. Uh, members of the jury, my learned friend referred just now to the case of the man who was jailed in 1921 for comparing Christ uh, to a circus clown. Uh, he remarked that we live in more enlightened times. We do indeed. Uh, in the highly successful musical Godspell, which some of you may have seen, Christ is portrayed as a circus clown. Having listened to the evidence, you may feel that the crime of blasphemy is an anachronism, that it has no place in this country in the 20th century. It is, however, still the law of the land. If there are any of the Jewish faith among you, Take no comfort that this law protects your faith. It protects but one faith, the Christian faith, the official state religion. Is it not curious that a religion which owes its very beginnings to a man convicted of blasphemy should be thus protected? Uh, when my client John Barnard in his song describes Jesus uh, as a blasphemer, he is, if we are to believe the Bible, telling the literal truth. I find the suggestion that the Christian faith needs the support and protection of a conviction in this courtroom today, an insult to Christianity. Now, you've heard that this law has been used in the past to suppress works by Shelley and Thomas Paine, but the charge of blasphemy was never brought against James Joyce, uh, perhaps one of the most influential writers of the 20th century. In his Ulysses, is the ballad of joking Jesus. Uh, here are the first two verses. I'm the queerest young fellow that ever you heard. My mother's a Jew, my father's a bird. With Joseph the joiner, I cannot agree. So here's to disciples and Calvary. If anyone thinks that I am not divine, he'll get no free drinks when I'm making the wine, but have to drink water and wish it were plain that I make when the wine becomes water again. Members of the jury, is Julie Gilmore guilty when Joyce was not? 
Is John Barnard guilty when Solomon was not? I ask for a verdict of not guilty. It is for you then to decide. Do you consider that the words of this song would shock and outrage Christians? If you feel they would merely annoy or upset you, then you must find the defendants not guilty. But what we're talking about is outrage. Do you feel outrage when you read these words? If you do, then I venture to suggest that you are well on the way to bringing in a verdict of guilty. My opinion of this song, the opinion of the council, or any of the witnesses that you have heard, are in the final count secondary to yours. Now I would ask you to retire, elect a foreman to speak for you, and consider your verdict. Members of the jury, will your foreman please stand? Just answer this question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict on which you're all agreed? Yes. Do you find the two defendants, Julie Gilmore and John Barnard, guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. 